Uh, I'm going to review the value and usefulness of the ethnic markers of ancient societies based on the assumption that certain populations practice certain eating and drinking habits. In other words, I will question the conviction that some food and drink habits may be used as reliable tools for determining the ethnicity of ancient societies. I will apply this argument to the case of the Philistines, a population of Aegean or Aegeo-Anatolian origin who settled in Palestine in the early 12th century BCE. I'll try to use this. Um, the Bible uses few uh, categories to distinguish the Philistines. These enemies of Israel, in, in, enemies in quotation marks, uh, were are uncircumcised, uh, which constitute clear opposition because the Israelites practice this rite as the sign of the cov covenant with God. The Philistines, according to the scriptures, lived for the most part in the five cities. Gaza, Gat, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron, which in the literature was misleadingly called the Philistine Pentapolis. Other features pointing to the dissimilarity between the Hebrews and the Philistines are urban type of settlement of the later and their great skills in metallurgy and efficiency in military techniques. However, the scholarly literature has adopted and uses extensively two other criteria to identif identify the Philistine, including the consumption of pork, pork, pork meat, and the use of decorated pottery, typical for the drinking of wine. As far as pork consumption is concerned, this crit criterion is based on two pieces of evidence. The increase of number of pork bones, bones excavated at Philistine sites dating back to the Iron Age and the biblical taboo prohibiting the consumption of the pork, expressed in Leviticus 11 uh, verse 7. A uh, correlation of these two facts and, um, has led some scholars to believe, sometimes unreflectively, that pork remains provide straightforward proof of the presence of non-Hebrew populations, including the Philistines. Obviously, the above-mentioned uh, above -mentioned reasoning is based on a few presuppositions and as, as such should not be accepted uncritically. Over 15 years ago, Brian Hess and Paula Vapnish published a now classical paper on using pig remains to determine ethnicity in ancient Near East. This paper constitutes a turning point in using peak remains as the indicator of ethnicity, or rather, not using them as an ethnic identi um, um, identification. Despite scholarly discussion on method method methodology, um, um, including and following the Hess and Vapov niche paper, one still witnesses the misunderstanding and misuses of archaeological data. Firstly, pig bones are being excavated from sites in Palestine that are not exclusively in strata dated to the Philistine presence. Therefore, this factor cannot be used as a positive indicator of ethnicity. The pig remains indicate that it, uh, in the pig, the, it, I mean, the pig uh, remains indicate such and such an ethnic group, but rather as a negative one. The lack of pig bones may indicate ethnic changes. As a matter of fact, the presence of pig bones does not necessarily indicate ethnic changes in population. It, it may follow the changes in climate, economical shifts, or social phenomena. phenomena. For example, nomads tend not to breed pigs while settled groups often do, or even the changes and development of religion. Secondly, the conviction that biblical ban on peak consumption expressed openly in Leviticus chapter 11, let us ignore um, for a while chronological issue, uh, provides 
uh, um, proves that Israelites uh, and proto-Israelites restrained from pork is, uh, is uh, simply naive. Such an attitude present, uh, represents simple pious and anachronistic wishful thinking. In general, the combination of arguments derived from the archaeological finds with arguments from the study of the Bible should be done with special caution. That being said, one must return to facts. The presence of pig bones The presence of pig bones at Philistine sites is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, stratum 12, uh, you'll see on the left of uh, Ashdod, is an interesting example. The ratio of animals' bones, uh, you can see, ah, you cannot see, sorry. So uh, the, the, it is similarly as in the right column, which is the uh, stratum 11, uh, in the 12, um, stratum 12, you, can, you have 58% uh, of your caprin, 14 of pigs, 10 sheep, 7 cattle, uh, 6, close to 6 goat, uh, 1.5 dog and 1.5 fish. In stratum 11, the ratio changed considerably to 66 cattle, 9 uh, of a caprin, 8 for pigs, 8 equites, 5.5 sheep, 1.8 fish, uh, and rest uh, are on the, on the chart. There are not enough remains from later strata to venture any generalization. Justin Leftoff compares the per percentage of big bones in the finds from the Philistine site of Gat and Ekron. The results of the comparison of this data from the large cities of undoubtedly Philistine type point to differences in pork consumption. In Gat, the percentage remain, remains stable, 13% in A, Iron Age 1, 13% Iron Age 2A, and 16% in Iron, Iron Age 2B. However, in Ekron, one witnesses a, tra a, a radical drop from 18% in Iron Age 1 to only 5% in Iron Age 2A and 3% in Iron Age 2B. As a result of this figure, one may conclude that the, these two neighboring Philistine cities practiced their poor consumption differently. Analogical research was conducted on a non-urban Philistine site of Kubur al-Walaida. The faunal remains from the stratum dated to Iron Age 2b, it equals to 8th and 7th centuries, uh, constituted the large number of sheep bones with a total absence of pig bones. This result is especially striking because the material culture found in earlier strata leave no doubt about its purely Philistine identity. This particular change may be due to processes taking place in region over the course of time, and one cannot exclude the strong impact of the local Semitic population. Alternatively, the differences between urban, Ashdod and Gat, uh, and semi-rural Kubr al walaida sites may con um, constitute the key factor um, affecting the scale of poor consumption. However, this discrepancies in per percentage of pig bones uh, in Gad and Ekron, and from the other hand Kubr al walaida indicate that the, per the presence of pig bones, or lack thereof, should not longer be used as an absolute, direct, or irre irrefutable proof of the ethnic identity of the ancient people. The reasoning, however, uh, is uh, complicated by the additional, um, of addition of new data. Israel Finkelstein and Steve Weiner, during the course of the realization of their ERC grant, undertook DNA analysis of the faunal remains from archaeological sites in Israel. This study included the gen genetic analysis of pig bones and the results are striking. 
uh, the pig bones found in Israel in the sites dated to Iron Age 1 belong to the European pig species. To, con to contrast to the remains originated from the Bronze Age strata, which were of Asiatic species. The most plausible explanation is that the Sea People took with them from their homeland their own pigs, which replaced the Aboriginal Asiatic species. In light of the information used uh, in the um, use, using the straightforward hypothesis linking poor consumption with the ethnic identity of the Philistines must be limited or even abandoned. If poor consumption had been the imminent um, uh, distinguishing factor of the Philistine ethnos, the same ratio of pig remains in the two similar Philistine sites should be expected. As we have seen, there is no one pattern in the case of the urban Philistine sites and the non-urban one. In order to explain this information, arguments about economic differences and local spe specifics were introduced. And as of now, unfortunately, there is no satisfactory way to correlate the economic status of the site and organization of food supplies to draw general pattern of peak breeding and pork consumption. Therefore, without specific way of link pork consumption with ethnicity and no obvious economic explanation of peak prop propagation, one should look in another direction to explain the phenomena uh, of changing percentage of peak remains in archaeological finds. I propose that the major factor, which seems to have been overlooked until now, is a cultic practice. Animal bones found in archaeological site in Israel were usually interpreted as hints to understanding the cuisine and diets of ancient people. It seems that scholars have sometimes neglected the fact that the most animals' meat was consumed in antiquity in connection with sacrificial activity. Keeping this in mind, one should remember that when archaeologists find animal remains, they reflect on one hand the evidence of meat consumption, but on the other the sacri sacrifice of the animals. Animal meat was too expensive for diary use, and it was and it is not necessarily to find uh, faunal remains uh, within temenos or nearby temples to conclude a sacrificial connotation. There is, of course, no difficulty to imagine a family eating a meal of meat at home after sacrifi sacrificing it as an offering in the temple. I therefore suggest the interpretation of the evidence of peaks and lack of thereof at archaeological site is a reflection of local cultic practice. In such a way, the percentage of animal uh, species found in the stratum may indicate the percentage of sacrificial animals. This hypothesis may help to explain the particularities and discrepancies in peak remains distribution across Philistine sites. Unfortunately, we still know very little about the cultic and religion, uh, cult and religion of Philist Philistia during the Iron Age. Biblical and archaeological data allows for only very vague generalization. Despite this, I am inclined to believe that the presence of pig bones may indicate a particular kind of cult in a similar way to growing number of dog bones. I can only suggest that um, this is a possible solution without further going to the details. Another distinctive feature of the Philistine in Iron Age I, according to the scholarly literature, is the presence of elegant pottery imitating Mycenaean decorated ware called Mycenaean 3C1B or the so-called monochrome and bichrome ware. Uh, shortly after the settlement of the Philistine in the Canaan, Philistine, Philistine pottery spread very quickly over Palestine. This is a nice drawing. 
um, where the decoration seems to imitate the Aegean style and then there is no doubt that the spread of the pottery should be linked to the population importing this style, the Philistines or other sea peoples. The traditional and still common way of joining archaeological finds with ethnic groups leads scholars to believe that territory containing Philistine pottery equals with the presence of the, pot of the Philistine. Does this suggest that every time we're in the present, uh, where, sorry, does this suggest that every time there is the presence of the Philistine pottery, it should be interpreted as the indicator of the Philistine presence? The distribution of pottery over Palestine can be very instructive. The most telling aspect may be the territory without any such pottery. One may interpret this map as a cartographical illustration of the climax of Philistine domination in this territory uh, during 11th and 10th century BCE. Interestingly enough, the territory with no traces of Philistine were used uh, uh, for um, uh, no traces for Philistine were uh, used for elegant aristocratic banquets, matches the territory of Israelites' ethnogenesis. One may believe that the Philistines simply did not enter these highlands. I do not accept this view because there is no reason why the domination Philistines would have left part of the land unoccupied. unoccupied. Why should they leave the Ephraim highland to proto-Israelites why establishing those strongholds in the Jordan Valley, you can see here they are Allah and Beth Shean. in the north, uh, Megiddo and Hazor, and many sites in the south. I believe that there's enough feature to be considered, and the key lies in the function of Mycenaean style pottery. Elegant and expensive pottery used for ceremonial aristocratic banquets was con uh, considered to be an obvious and easy to dis distinguish status marker. The owners of, this, of such sets of pottery informed their rivals and dependents that their position was firm and their domination easy to see. The pottery may have served as ostentatious proof of their social economic status. Only the elites could have afforded such a luxury and only they had means to adopt the habits of aristocratic banquets. What can be inferred from the lack of Philistine pottery in, high, in Ephraim <laughs> highlands? The result does not lead to a naive hypothesis of the political independence of proto-Israelites from the hegemony, hegemony of the Philistines. The result provides more information about the type of population living there. Proto-Israelites were living in small villages and their fairly homogeneous society was flat as far as social strata are concerned. In such a community of countrymen in opposition to the urban dwellers, it was quite difficult to obtain surplus that allowed for such luxury goods. Additionally, in such a egalitarian society, the need to show one's social superiority over, over others was very limited. In flat society, status markers are useless. In summary, one may ask whether indicators such as poor consumption and why, one, why drinking was, uh, are uh, useful criteria for establishing the Philistine ethnos. The answer is ambiguous. On one hand, the straightforward assumption that seeing the presence of both or one of these criteria as obvious proof of the presence of the Philistines should be abandoned. On the other hand, such data should not be overlooked and ignored. Examined in a broader context and incorporate, incorporated uh, in a wider spectrum of information, they may provide precious pieces of evidence for historians and archaeologists. 
the, uh, these aspects to taken together may shed light on the ethnic, economic, social, religious and cultural life of ancient Palestine. Thank you.